And I use this in the class that I taught. I taught a whole class on um, moral neuroscience uh, at MIT two semesters ago, so they knew what they were getting. When they opened their exam, the beginning of the exam said, I, Professor Sachs, I know each one of you, and I know you guys are too honest and too proud of your work to cheat on this exam. And they laughed when they saw that. Um, okay, so reduce the sense of personal standards that, that the action should be evaluated with respect to personal standards. And then finally, the force which I think is the most powerful force for eliciting bad behavior is tell people a story that reframes that behavior in terms of a greater or other good. And um, so this actually I think is a particularly powerful reframing of the famous Milgram experiments. How many people in the room know what I'm talking about if I say the Milgram experiments? Okay, since a few people don't, I'll just uh, refresh everybody's memory. This is a super famous set of experiments conducted at Yale in the 60s and 70s uh, by Stanley Milgram, who had people come into the lab. They were told this was a learning experiment, but it was part of a big scientific project at Yale. It would involve assigning one person to the teacher role, the other person to the learner role. They were told this was random. And they were told that in order for the experiment to go on, they, once they were assigned to the teacher role, had to deliver punishments to the learner, the unfortunate person assigned to the learner role, in the form of electric shock. The learner was then strapped down to the chair and given a uh, um, false memory, a memory experiment, a pseudo memory experiment. And the teacher was told, in order to do this experiment, you have to keep delivering shocks when the learner gets the answer wrong. The question was how far would people go before they refused to keep going? Would they go to when the learner objected? Would they go to when it was painful, when the learner was screaming? How about when the learner went silent and there was a thud? And what the famous answer to this question is that people will go all the way. Regular human beings brought into this experiment will keep delivering shocks over and over again, even when the person is screaming and complaining of a bad heart. And this was interpreted in terms of obedience, that people are overly obedient authority. But actually, in lots of contexts, people are not obedient, so even to very legitimate authority, as Lee Ross mentioned, and I certainly find, my students are not obedient to me, and I'm a much more legitimate authority in that context. So what is it that made people go all the way? And um, Alex Haslam was a really powerful reanalysis that people went all the way in that experiment because they believed it was necessary for the greater good. The people who went all the way were the people to whom science was important. They found it uncomfortable, but they thought they were doing something in the service of a greater good. And I think that is often the most powerful way to get people to do truly bad acts. Okay, so that's four ways to get individuals to act badly. Um, but what I'm going to talk about here is that there's a way to get all of these forces operating in concert simultaneously, and it's really easy. You just keep, put people in group competition. As soon as people are in a group competing against another group, all of these effects operate, and that's what I'm going to show you um, as we go along. Um, but one of the things that this does is it helps to explain um, one of the final and uh, more poorly named phenomena in social psychology. This is called the inter-individual inter-group discontinuity effect. I didn't name it. Um, it comes down to people are nastier when they're in groups. Um, this has been shown many ways, but one of the main examples of this is that you ask people to assign somebody else a stranger an amount of hot sauce, really hot hot sauce, that they're going to have to drink. The dependent measure is just how much hot sauce do you assign the stranger? How much do you make them drink? Um, and the answer is that the bigger the group you're in when making this decision, the more people that jointly make this decision, the more hot sauce you assign. So just put people in a group and they act nastier. Why? So the argument we make is because groups create all of these conditions. Starting with assigning people to groups, just the act of assigning people to groups creates psychological distance where it didn't exist before. So we've been working on this at a set of experiments in my lab, which we do online. People come into an experiment. This is done via Amazon and Chemical Charts. So they're told, you're just going to do an experiment. It takes about 10 minutes. We ask you a few questions about yourself. And once we get the answers, we tell you, first of all, congratulations, you are a rapper. And furthermore, in this game, you and the Rattlers are competing against the Eagles in a game, and when whichever team wins will get a $1 bonus per player. So that's all you know about the Eagles and the Rattlers. And now we say, but before you start the competitive game, 
We find that it helps people in their performance of the game if they know a little bit about the people that they're playing with and against. So we're going to tell you some, just a little bit of information about the people on your team and the other team. And the question we want you to answer is, how close do you feel to this person? The way that you say how close is you read a little information about this person, so you know Lydia is a rapper, and one thing that's happened to her, she missed a bus. And now we ask you to drag these two circles together to show how close or far apart you feel to Lydia. So there's a circle labeled self and a circle labeled Lydia, and you drag the circle labeled self until it's about the right distance for how close you feel to Lydia. So these are the results for um, this basic experiment showing how close people said they felt to now this complete stranger Lydia if she was on her own team or if she was on the other team. And so all we've done is tell you you're a rattler, she's an eagle, and already you feel less close to her. This is true whether we're telling you some trivial fact about her, like she missed a bus, or some more consequential description of something that happened in her life, like she missed her best friend's wedding. And it's not only closeness, the same thing extends to how much empathy you feel for her experience in that event. If we ask you, for example, how good or bad you feel for Lydia that she missed the bus or her best friend's wedding, you feel more bad for her in this case um, if she's on your team than on the other team. So that's not so surprising, um, except for how minimal the intervention is, right? All we had to do was tell you that you're on one side, she's on the other side, and already you feel less close to her and less empathy for her. One thing we wanted to know is, who does this affect? So you might think, for example, that the people who are going to be most affected by our little intervention are essentially psychopaths. People who are low on empathy all around. People who just don't have that much to give. Um, and in fact, there are there is a variable range of how much empathy people in this experiment say they feel in general. We measured that with the self-report questionnaire. And we find that how empathetic you say you are as a person does predict how much empathy you feel for Lydia, whether she's on your group or on the other group. What it doesn't predict is the difference, what we're calling parochialism how much more empathy or closeness you feel for somebody in your group compared to somebody in the other group. In fact, what this is actually reflecting, we think, is not psychopaths, but, but something good, team players, people who feel connected to their own team. So when we ask people, how much do you like your own team, how much do you feel connected to your own team, that is not related to how much empathy you feel in general. Um, but what it is related to is the parochialism, how much more empathy you feel for your side than the other side. Um, this general idea that you can assign people to teams, even randomly, and immediately create a competition which engenders a lack of closeness and lack of empathy has been known for a really long time. The most famous example is the Robbers Cave experiment conducted at a summer camp in the 50s, um, in which Sharif took, again, just groups of kids, assigned them to two groups, they self-named the, their teams, the Rattlers and the Eagles, and immediately started trying to sabotage one another. So, what we, so this tells us just putting people in groups, that's already enough to now elicit psychological distance. What about to remove personal responsibility? Again, this is a classic phenomenon. The more people there are, the less responsible you feel. Um, the, one of the famous demonstrations of this is the bystander effect by Darlene Latani, published in the 60s. In this experiment, they had people walk past somebody having a fit and falling on the ground. And the question is, did you stop to help? The stranger's in trouble, do you stop to help? And how long does it take you? If you're alone, if there's nobody else there, people stop pretty fast, and most people stop. If there's one other person with you, you're just with somebody else in the room, less people stop, and it takes them longer to stop. If there's three other people in the room, it takes much longer to stop, and even fewer people stop. And they call this diffusion of responsibility. The more people there are, the less likely you are to help, which is why if you're in trouble in a situation in the world if you're being attacked, you shouldn't assume that if there's a crowd around your safe, you should look at one person and ask for help. Let's take a Okay, so that's the classic phenomenon. Um, interestingly, creating a feeling of a potentiates this even more. So in this experiment, um, the kind of harm that was being studied, and this is a recent experiment, was the making a stranger just into a 
a powerful, irritating white noise blast. The question was, in assigning them a task, could you assign them this really irritating noise blast? Um, the manipulation was groups of people in a room, before they were asked to do this um, task, were either given movements to do that they did with other people synchronously or asynchronously. Again, the idea here is if you and I are moving in synchrony, we feel more bound as a team. This is very subtle because the synchrony manipulation was putatively unrelated to the aggression context. Um, but nevertheless, people who were asked to move synchronously with the other people around them acted more aggressively against another group of people. And this effect was even bigger if one of the people you've just been moving with makes a suggestion. So they say, what do you think? Should we make them listen to the noise? If you add a suggestion, the suggestion by itself increases the amount of aggression. But suggest the suggestion in the context of a synchronous group is actually extremely powerful. It's super additive. You get over 80% of the people in the group choosing the aggressive act if they've just felt cohesively bonded with their group and then suddenly in their group suggests aggression as a possible action. The red here is the super additivity. It's more than just synchrony or a suggestion on their own. So once you feel bonded in a group, if just one member of your group suggests aggression, aggression becomes a much more viable option. And an interpretation here is that this is both diffusing responsibility, it's the whole group that feels responsible, and displacing responsibility. You don't have to feel like you chose the aggressive action, it was the person who suggested it who chose it. That makes it even easier to act aggressively. Okay, so that's groups diffusing and displacing responsibility. The third thing that people have argued is producing the salience of your personal moral norms making you fail to consider how your actions relate to your personally held moral standards. This is hard to measure, and so I'm going to go more slowly through it. This is also one of the topics that we've studied with an fMRI experiment in my lab. So here the idea is playing as a team, when you feel like you and your team are playing together, will make you fail to consider your actions in terms of your own personally held moral norms. But that's a hard hypothesis to test because what we need to what we need to measure then is whether or not you are spontaneously considering your own moral norms or the self-relevance of the moral norms. And people have tried to do this before. One of the things that they've done is ask you after the fact, were you considering your own moral norms back then? Or how much self-awareness did you have? But asking people to retrospectively reflect on a lack of self-awareness that they had earlier is asking people to do a lot, right? You have to now be self-aware about your previous lack of self-awareness. <laughs> and so what we wanted to do is design an experiment where we could measure in the moment how relevant to your actions do your own moral norms feel. To do that, we came up with a pretty complicated experiment, so I'm going to walk you through it. This is Nina Sakari's experiment. What we needed to do was identify what people's own personal moral norms are, so figure out what they consider the moral standards for their behavior. Get them to consider those moral norms, but under the radar, so that we wouldn't basically we wouldn't create demand characteristics in the context. Just have them considering those moral norms without being explicitly asked to evaluate them. We wanted to do this while in a team or alone. So the hypothesis is that being in a team will reduce the salience of moral norms. We needed to compare being in a team not the Then measure how self-relevant those thoughts, and here we're going to do that in terms of a neural measure, and which I'll go into in a bit when we get there, and test whether that predicts your willingness to harm the actor. So that's a complicated experiment to design, and I'm going to walk you through each step, how we do this in each, uh, one by one. Okay, so step one is figure out what people's own moral behavioral norms are. In order to do this, one week before our participants came in for this experiment, we sent them a long questionnaire. It had many sentences describing both their physical traits, their behaviors, and included some morally relevant statements. Things um, all in the first person. Things like, I have stolen food from a shared refrigerator. I always apologize after bumping into someone. I have helped a friend cheat on an exam. So those are potentially moral behaviors. And we had people tell us how true of themselves these sentences were, so we could now code them as 
true of the participant or not true of the participant. Um, these items were then converted for the purposes of our experiments um, into first person and third person sentences. So the ones that they said were true of themselves, we now had as first person, and the ones that they said were not true of themselves, we put in the third person. So now you're reading about first person sentences that are true of you, third person sentences that are not true of you. That's to try to create a condition of sentences that refer to your own norms and a control condition that doesn't refer to your own norms. Okay. And then these sentences, the key sentences for our hypothesis, we put in an experiment as the filler items, the items you had to ignore. What were the target items? They were similar sentences, but they were about social communication. Fortunately, our participants, mostly undergrads, will buy almost any cover story for what you were doing in an experiment. And so we said we were studying social communication, and in particular, how, people, how people's brains respond to social media and information about social media. This is apparently plausible because everybody believed us. And so we then told them, what we want you to do is as fast as possible detect sentences that are about social media. We never mentioned that there were first person and third person sentences, and in fact, people didn't seem to notice that. We just told them, you're going to be detecting as fast as possible the presence of social media in, these, in the sentences that you're reading. So you're going to push a button for the target sentences, the ones that have social media context, ignore anything else. So now inside the sentences that they're ignoring are moral descriptions. And inside those are moral descriptions that apply to them. So that's how we're putting your own moral norms in front of your eyeballs, but under the radar. Does that make sense? Okay, because we're going to have to keep building on it. So hang on to this idea. So people are looking at sentences about their own moral standards. But in the context of the task, they have nothing to do with that information. They're just supposed to ignore it, because what they're looking for are these other sentences, the ones that are about social media. Okay, and now our hypothesis is that those sentences that are about your own moral norms will become less salient to you when you're playing in a team. How can we make you play in a team? Well, again, so we now just told you the same way we did in our internet experiments, congratulations, you're an eagle or you're a rattler. In this case, you're an eagle. You're going to be playing against a rattler. And the whole eagle team is playing together right now, we told them. Again, it's really good they'll believe whatever. And we told them, all of the other eagles are signing in right now. We showed them little movies of what looked like Skype windows of nine people signing in and giving a thumbs up that they were ready to go. So they shot, saw these, ten, these little videos of all the other nine people. We said every team has ten people on it. You're the tenth member of the Eagles. Every, but when the team is playing, the whole team is playing simultaneously, and your score depends on everybody's speed and accuracy. So the faster and more accurate you and everyone else on your team is, the more points your team will get. And then we told you that at the end of the game, we're going to give the team that wins a hundred bucks to split amongst themselves. So you'll essentially get an extra 10 bucks. What we said is the team that performs the best gets 100 bucks. Okay, so that's playing with the team. And then as a performer afterwards, can we balance? We said, okay, but you're also going to play this game alone. Everybody plays this game alone as well as with their team. When you're playing alone, there's also a bonus. The top half of players get an extra 10 bucks when they're playing alone. Okay, so you play this game both alone and in your team. When you're your team, you're all interdependent. How well you do affects the rest of your team. How well they do affects you. When you're playing alone, it's just every man for themselves. Okay, so that's how we get you playing in a team. And now we want to measure, while you're playing this game, detecting the sentences about social media, are the sentences about your own moral norms self-relevant? And the way that we do this is we take advantage of extensive previous research on this brain region in the medial prefrontal cortex. That's just behind the middle of your forehead. This is a brain region that is associated with sentences or facts about yourself. The way that we identified this brain region in this experiment is we had people looking at words like creative or impulsive or impatient and saying whether or not that was true of themselves, that's the active condition, or true of Barack Obama, that's the control condition, and this brain region is more active if you're thinking 
about yourself than when you're thinking about a famous other person like Barack Obama. This sentence is also, this brain region weather is also more true when you read sentences that are true of you or when you say yes to the question, is this true of you? Basically, activity in this brain region is an index of when you're considering something, whether that feels self-relevant or not. Is it, is it true of you? So that's the brain region we identified. And so then our hypothesis is more activity in this brain region means that what you're thinking in the moment when you see that sentence is that feels true of me. That matters to me. Okay? Part that so far so good? Okay. So now we have four steps, right? We have sentences that are describe somebody's moral norm, which we're presenting as distractors, so under the radar, you're reading them, but you don't have to do anything about them. While you're playing in a team, or you're playing alone, and we're measuring activity in a brain region that is an unobtrusive index of self-relevance. And our prediction is, to the extent that playing in a team makes you lose your attention to your own moral norms, you will be more willing to engage in harm than an outcome. So now we have to measure harm. The way we did this is again, as part of our cover story, we said there's going to be a lot of press attention to our research. And so we're already getting ready with our press report. And we need to decide which pictures of the teams to put in the press report. So we just want you to help us out. Here's six screen captured shots from somebody who's on one of the teams, either an eagle or a rattler. If it's an eagle, this person will look familiar because you saw them in that signing in video. Pick one of these for us to put in our press records. And we had them pre-rated for how flattering these were. So some of them are more flattering than others. There's six for each person. And the, the harm measure we were interested in was would you choose less flattering pictures of the other team than of your own team? At this point, you should be not surprised that in spite of the fact that these are strangers and that all we've done is told you that they are rattlers, People choose more flattering pictures of their own team than of the other team. So, to whatever extent social reputation is a harm in our world, people are essentially willing to post to the media more unflattering photographs of people they see as not on their team. Okay, so that's our measure of harm. And then the key, here's the key question. Okay, so I'll walk you through it again. On the bottom, we have activity in this brain region. While you're seeing sentences that are true of yourself compared to the control condition, the third person one, these are moral sentences. So the more you activate this brain region, the more you're viewing moral sentences that are true of you as self-relevant. The less you activate it, the less you think it's self-relevant. And the y-axis is willingness to harm. It's actually right. So it's how much less flattering. You are, you are willing to be. Is that right? Okay, I have a question. This is so complicated that you cannot get it wrong. Okay, so. Oops, yeah, I did it again. Great. So if you think about. Yeah, I think that it's in the It's in the next slide. If you are thinking about yourself in the context, I'll walk through this. If you are thinking about yourself when you're playing a game, you will choose equally flattering pictures for your team and the other team. If you are not thinking about yourself when you see moral sentences in the game, you will choose more flattering pictures of the anger compared to the other. And, and that is only true of moral sentences and only true when playing on a team. Okay. All right. So that is the evidence from neuroscience that when you're playing on a team, your own personal moral norms become less salient to you, meaning that your behavior is not held even to your own moral standards. Okay, that's part three. Going back to the easier step, back to psychology, part four, putting you in a group makes it easier to justify your actions as necessary for a greater good. So again, this has been done in many different ways. One famous way is by giving people an opportunity to cheat. This has been extensively reported in Dan Ariely's books. This is data from his book, um, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. In these experiments, you give people a chance to cheat on a task for money. So I give you a, a task, I ask you how many 
many correct, how many to solve a whole bunch of puzzles, and at the end I either score how many puzzles you solved, or I ask you to self-score and report back to me how many correct answers did you get. So these are the data if, you, if I score you and everybody on this task gets about seven answers right. However, if I ask you, just tell me how many answers you got right, all of a sudden people get about ten answers. So that bump up, getting three more answers correct, that's basically opportunistic cheating. I gave you a chance to cheat, and you do. A little bit. The important point that Dan Ariely is making in this book is that it's not that a few people cheat a lot, it's that pretty much everybody cheats a little bit. Okay, but then what if your cheating doesn't only benefit you? So if you're not the one who's going to make the money, a friend is going to make money for every correct answer that you get. If it's a friend who's going to make the money, now you get about 14 answers correct. And in fact, if your whole group is going to make money, now you're almost perfect. You get 17 out of 18 answers correct. So it seems like the opportunity to say, well, it's not selfishness, right? That the opportunity, the cover story of altruism provokes much greater cheating than you would allow yourself to do on your own behalf. So the presence of a group provides the cover, the reframing, for excessive, in this case, selfishness, and also aggression. So the same thing we see if you measure aggression, this is now in a prisoner's dilemma game. So people are competing in a game in which you can either choose to cooperate, so everybody gets a small game, or defect, in which case you can get a very large game at the expense of the other person getting a large loss, um, unless they defect too. So choices to defect are choices to uh, impose a loss on the other side in order to get a big gain on your side. Putting people in a prisoner's dilemma context where they are playing on behalf of other people changes their behavior in two ways. First of all, if you ask people, what are your goals in this context? People who are playing for themselves say that to some extent they want to maximize their gain at the expense of the other side. But if they're playing for other people who are partly dependent on them, now they start to say, you know, I kind of more want to maximize our game at the expense of the other side. And if you're put in charge of your team's outcomes, so if you're the leader of a team and everybody's depending on you, now you really want to maximize your team's game at the expense of the other side. You see the opposite if you ask, are you trying to maximize everybody's game? The game not only of your team, but of the other team as well. People who are playing for themselves say, yeah, I want to maximize everybody's game. If your team is a little bit dependent on you, then the other side matters less. If you're the leader of a team, then you care even less about maximizing the joint outcome for everybody involved. And the consequence of this is that if you look at this aggressive act of defecting a prisoner's dilemma game, you get increasing defection the more your team is depending on you. Uh, this is an important taking message for leaders. Okay, so. People are more selfish on behalf of others, they're more aggressive on behalf of others, and this difference also translates into differential support for aggressive action, depending on how you feel about your group. So these are data looking across cultures at cultural norms, the relationship between two different cultural norms, how much your culture values loyalty to your own group, and how much you support aggressive acts against other groups. So here on the bottom is, uh, differences across cultures in the importance of group loyalty. And what you can see is that the more your culture emphasizes group loyalty, the more you tolerate, as on the, um, stuff, the squares on top here, the more you tolerate or even um, uh, advocate inter-ethnic violence, so um, violence against other groups. Of course, the less tolerant you are of um, violence within and this is true not only as cultural variability, but also within cultures. So studies that look at what, what predicts um, support for aggressive actions against our groups, for example, supporting torture of potential terrorism suspects, uh, or just at very high levels of defense spending. Within American culture, people who put more emphasis on group loyalty, in fact, the extent to which you emphasize group loyalty in your moral values, predicts how much you support spending, um, defense spending, or how much you would support torture of a terrorism suspect. Um, this is also true if you look in other cultures, 
one of the things that characterizes would-be suicide bombers who've been um, interviewed by psychologists is not actually lack of empathy, but very high loyalty and empathy towards their own group. Uh, so overall, again, the lesson here is that putting people in groups pushes every psychological button there is for provoking excessive levels of aggression and selfishness. This is presumably why we act more naturally in groups. And this is a very deep part of our psychology, so much so that it's true already in two and three and four year olds. This work by Marjorie Rhodes at NYU, who has found that if you ask little kids, is it okay for one person to punch another person, typically they say no, of course. They've learned this lesson. They've been told punching is not okay. But if you tell them a story where those two people are in different groups competing for who can build the highest block tower, now it's more okay to punch somebody if they're on the other side. So the psychology of excessive aggression and selfishness is easy to elicit in either the right or the wrong circumstances, especially in groups. Um, and I'm just going to stop with a brief aside and, and wonder something, which is, um, this is I had an anthropologist join my lab recently, and she wanted to know about how cultural forces play into this. And so I set her a puzzle that I'm interested in just setting to us as well, um, which is that when you read the social psychology, um, the lesson you might come away with is actually all you need is the social psychology. That it, you can provoke every aspect of intergroup conflict with just these situational elements of psychology. Um, making me wonder, do you actually need the other forces that Martha was talking about? Do you need real identity? like Bosnia versus Serbia and the history and culture and economics to get a, to get a real inter-ethnic violent culture going? Or could you get it going between any two groups of people, between people shorter than 5 foot 5 and taller than 5 foot 5, or people who walk with their left foot first or their right foot first, or blue right people and brown eyed people? If you could just tell a story, put people in the dark, diffuse their responsibility, displace their responsibility, and then tell a story about the greater good that is served. It's just a puzzle. Um, it's a particularly pessimistic one, though, because if we can create a conflict anytime, anywhere, out of nothing, then it will be much harder to prevent conflict. Which takes us to the second part. So given how easy it is to elicit aggression and selfishness, the question is, well, what can we do to decrease or prevent it? And uh, I think that the intuition many people have is we'll start by humanizing the other side. Start by listening to the other side's story. Um, and um, this is where, uh, where we started, is looking at the role that telling a story or engaging with the other person's mind, coming back to my prior interest in theory of mind, what can that do to reduce the psychological distance and to decrease these intergroup, um, in, the intergroup biases. In our simple paradigm that we do on Amazon Turk, where we create biases just on the fly by assigning you to a group, we can also test what we can do to decrease those biases. Um, and so some of the people who came to our experiment, instead of just reading about Lydia that she missed a bus, first read a little story about Lydia. So they read that she's been interested in going to her best friend's wedding for her whole life. She's going to be the maid of honor. She's getting ready to try on a bridesmaid's dress. Now you have a little insight into Lydia and her mind. And now I can ask you, how close do you feel to Lydia just after you know these few extra facts? Okay, so this again is our closeness measure. These are the data I showed you before, now expressed as a different score. So this is how much closer you feel to people in your group compared to people in the other group. And when we add the story, we can decrease the distance. So now, knowing a little more about Lydia, you feel a little less far away from her if she's on the other side. Um, the same thing is also true for writers of empathy. So again, here's the, dif the difference in how much empathy you felt for her when she missed the bus. And we can make that smaller by telling you a little more about her. That is in a very minimal context, right? These groups have lasted for you know, a good 10 minutes at this point. And so a key question, obviously, is with the same idea, the, the idea of listening to the other side's story, would that work 
when it matters, when it works for real groups in real conflict. Um, and so this is work that Emilio Bruno did, trying to study the effect of getting people to take the other side's perspective, but now in a real conflict. This experiment was conducted initially in Ramallah and Tel Aviv, and then replicated at, on the Mexican-American border in Arizona, at, with first Israelis and Palestinians, and then with um, white local Americans and um, Mexican immigrants, many of them illegal immigrants. And the question is now, when the stakes are high and there is a history, is it still helpful to be asked to listen to the other side's experiences, to listen to their story? To get a reasonable sample of people, not just those who are specifically motivated to engage in this kind of intergroup interaction, we put out a very broad recruitment for participants, saying that it was an MIT psychology study that may involve interaction with members of another culture. And uh, the design of this study is that when you came into the study, we asked you a whole bunch of questions in a survey that was supposedly the main experiment. Then we interrupted the survey to say, we're going to now engage in a brief interaction with a member of another culture for the, uh, for the Mexican American, the Mexicans and the Americans. Um, we told them that this was a study of uh, online translation. So they were writing in their native language. We said we were studying translate. Um, and so they would have this brief interaction with members of another culture, and then we asked you some of the same questions again in the subsequent survey. And the question is, could we change your attitudes just with this brief about 15 minute long interaction? So again, critically in the survey, you answered 50 questions over the course of the survey, but hidden in those 50 questions were nine questions that you answered twice, once before the interaction and once after the interaction. Those are the critical items, and the other items were just fillers. And if you were, for example, in Israeli, those nine critical items included sentences like this. I feel sad when I see a Palestinian suffering as when I see an Israeli Jew suffering, or Palestinians are more violent by nature, or I don't believe in the peaceful intentions of the Palestinians. If you were a white American, you might see these sentences, the suffering of Mexican immigrants really concerns me. Mexican immigrants are generally ignorant and selfish. Or the average Mexican immigrant is motivated by self-interest. So again, hidden in this big survey are these nine critical items. And we're going to ask, can we change the answer that you give on these items from before to after, getting you to really hear the story of a member of that group? The way we got you to really hear the story is, again, we told you you're going to have a brief interaction that we're studying um, online communication, or in the um, American, Mexican American context, we're studying online translation. We're studying how the online media affects the ability to communicate about complicated topics. Two people are going to be chosen at random from a wide range of cultures. One of those people is going to be assigned to the speaker role. And this is the randomly assigned, we said. This is the speaker role. They'll be asked to describe one or two of the most difficult aspects of life in their community. And the other person is going to be randomly assigned to the listener role. The listener's role is just to summarize what the speaker said, not contributing their own opinion. So again, the idea here is that putting somebody in the listener role sort of forces them to hear what the other person is saying, because they've been given this assignment. Just summarize in your own words what you just heard that person say. So after we had described the two rules and the assignment and everybody understood that they were going to have a partner chosen and one would be assigned to one role and the other one to the other role, then we told them which role they were assigned to. So again, if we're studying perspective taking or listening, you were assigned to the listener role. And then we said, okay, now we're going to figure out what other culture the person is from. Uh, and in this case, uh, definitely cheated. This was not at all random. So if you were a white American, it was always a Mexican immigrant's perspective. If you were Israeli, it was always a Palestinian perspective that you were assigned to hear. Everybody was fully debriefed after the experiment and given the opportunity to withdraw their data if they weren't comfortable with what we were doing. So although we did deceive them in advance, nobody contributed data to the experiment without being fully debriefed about what we were doing. Okay. So again, the key question is, from immediately before to immediately after, listening to the story of a member of this other group, and then just saying it back in their own words, saying what they said, could we change 
your attitudes towards that group more generally. Um, and so this again is going to be change. So uh, moving up is better. That means you have better attitudes towards the other group afterwards than you did before. And fortunately, hopefully, optimistically, and, and uh, converging with what other people have found, in Israelis we found positive change. Listening to the story of a Palestinian led to more positive attitudes towards Palestinians. And we replicated this in white um, listening to the story of Mexican immigrants. However, that was not true for Palestinians listening to the stories of Israelis. Um, and if anything, we found the opposite effect in the Mexican immigrants listening to a white American talk about the pressures that immigration was putting on white Americans in Arizona. So the first lesson of this research is that listening to other people's stories does improve attitudes towards that group for some groups, right? But not for everybody. And furthermore, um, it's not true that it depends only on what group you're from. Um, this is from data from um, Jackie Vorar, now working with European Canadians, thinking about Native, Native Canadians. So this is comparable to white Americans thinking about immigrants in some ways. And they, were gonna, they first watched a documentary, and then were asked about the desire to interact with a person in that group. So the measure here now is, do you want to interact with a member of that group, and do you think they want to interact with you? The intervention was that you watch this documentary either while remaining objective or while has to be given instructions to really try to empathize with, really hear and think about what it feels like to be a Native Canadian in the documentary. And what they found is that compared to how much you wanted to interact with a Native a Canadian and how much you thought they wanted to interact with you if you just watched objectively, really empathizing decreased your perception of their desire to interact with you and decreased your desire to interact with them. They interpret this in terms of the activation of meta stereotypes. When you watch this documentary and you empathize with the Native Canadians, you start to feel how mad they're going to be at you and get defensive and then back off all before the interaction has happened, right? Even before you had a chance to have an interaction at all. Okay, so listening to the other side's perspective improves the group attitudes for some people some of the time. And that is actually not as ringing an endorsement as it sounds like we were going to have. And I just want to point this out as one important role for the contribution science can make to reducing excessive aggression and selfishness that we'll come back to, is qualifying um, over-optimistic intuition. But um, listening is not the only thing that we can do. And so I'm going to talk about an alternative. There isn't only listening. There are lots of other ways to, um, to reduce intergroup aggression and selfishness. And one that I think is really important is, in some sense, the opposite. It's talking and telling. So I told you about this experiment from the perspective of the listener, but actually half of our participants were assigned to be the speaker. So they were assigned to actually write about what it feels like, to what the challenges are that their group is facing in their culture, and have a member of the other side listen and tell back to them what they, what they heard. So now we can compare not only across groups, but also across experiences, whether what you were asked to do was listen, or whether you, what you were given an opportunity to do was speak and be heard. So again, these are the data that you saw before. Being given a chance to speak had a moderate and not significant effect in both the Israeli and the white groups, but actually had a very significant positive effect in the Palestinians. Um, and a, a small positive effect for the Mexican Americans, definitely better than being asked to listen. Um, so this is an alternative. There isn't only listening in dialogue. There's also being heard. And of course, there's a lot of other things you can do as well. Instead of competing, you can cooperate. We can also try to intervene on the other things I described. We can try to reduce intergroup cohesion. We've done both of these in the um, little online experiment I told you about. So in the experiment I told you about where we assign you Rattler's Eagles, in the version I told you about, we put the Rattler's Eagles in competition for the dollar bonus. But we could also say every group gets a dollar when they get to 100 points. Now the other group doesn't matter that much to your outcomes. And then we reduce the bonus. Or we could say both groups get the, the dollar bonus when both groups reach 200 points jointly. And then the bias gets even smaller. So cooperating 
rather than competing, even when you're assigned to groups, can reduce the bias you feel towards the other groups. Another thing you can do is change the perception of the natures of the groups. Again, here we rely on credulity about MIT. We say, based on your answers, we've made a social network of the groups. And here's the social network. We didn't say how we made it, and it was, in fact, totally bogus. But you can see that this social network makes it looks like there's two cohesive and very separate groups. Or we can say, and here's the social network. Now it looks like the groups are much less separated, much less cohesive. And compared to when the groups look really separate, intermingling the groups, just with this very brief presentation of a graphic based on nothing, we could reduce the extent to which people differentiated their group from the other group in this measure of bias. And, and again, these are the, the deep principles of contact theory that were developed after experiments in the 50s, like the um, Robert Heave experiment, that you need to reduce the perception of the difference between the groups, make the groups cooperate on a common goal, equalize the power between the two groups, and, 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 and many other factors that are now being implemented by, by hundreds, if not thousands, of intervention programs around the world designed to promote peace. Okay, so if, as it feels like, we sort of already knew all of this, right, if we sort of could intuit that these were the ingredients that were necessary for intergroup intervention to reduce intergroup aggression and selfishness, then what is the goal for neuroscience going forward, right, if these intuitive principles are already being applied? Um, and so now what I'm going to talk about is what I see as the future, the future will for both science more broadly and neuroscience in particular in contributing to uh, bettering intergroup interventions and reducing excessive aggression and selfishness between groups. And it depends on an analogy to baseball. As Victor just discovered, I'm a sports fan. And this story that I'm going to tell you is now very popular because of the book Moneyball and the movie based on that book starring Brad Pitt. This is the story told brilliantly by Michael Lewis about Billy Bean. But Billy Bean was the general manager of a Wobegon baseball team, the Oakland A's, who were perpetually out of money compared to their big name competitors, the Yankees and the Red Sox. Here we go, boo, boo. Okay, so the Yankees and the Red Sox always have more money than anybody else. How is a poor Oakland A's team and Billy Bean's idea was to beat them, essentially, with science. Because the best model at the time of how to put together a baseball team depended on the professional, honed, and very expensive intuitions of trained scouts. People who knew what to look for when putting it together a team and went around to the Youth Baseball Leagues of America looking for the people who had what it takes to contribute to a baseball team and then paying for what they saw. What Billy Bean intuited is that the intuitions of the scouts were not as good as they could be. And he made three basic contributions to Moneyball, which is now how baseball is run. The first one is that before you get started doing science, you have to define what you're trying to achieve, define the goal. And one of his major contributions, Billy Bean's major contributions, was to define the goal of running a baseball team as winning baseball games. Now, it's amazing that that counts as a massive intuition, because you might think that's rather obvious. What a baseball game team is supposed to do is win baseball games. But it turns out that what scouts were looking for was people who hit home runs. And so the first step that Billy Bean had to do was say, what we are trying to do is not win home runs. What we are trying to do is win baseball games. And when you have that intuition, you can ask, well, what leads to winning baseball games? And the analysis that he did suggested something quite counterintuitive. It helps to hit home runs, but it's actually more important not to get out. The most important contribution the batter makes to winning a game when he comes to bat is not getting out. Which means that it's just important if you get hit by the ball and walk, or walk, if you get on first base, in any way that leads to you not getting out, you are making a contribution to winning the game. And this led to the development of better measures of what you're looking for in a baseball player. Instead of looking for somebody confident and tall and handsome and with the right kind of girlfriend, and also who hits a lot of home runs, now what you're looking for 
or is somebody with a thing called OPX, on base plus slugging, which is a totally weird score out of five that counts basically how unlikely you are to get out and how far you are to get around the base path at any given at bat. And this I take basically as a model for what science can do in contributing to society. What we need to do is force team, the, force the people who are doing the interventions first to tell us what are you trying to achieve? What is the outcome that you want us to improve? When we know what the outcome is, whether it's reducing genocide or improving intergroup attitudes or provoking um, collective action um, in the service of the minority group, when we know what we're trying to achieve, then we can develop and test causal models. That's what science is, it's what we do, right? And those causal models ought to have the mind and brain in them because that's where the action happens. So we can test, we can build causal models, and we can potentially test them because neuroimaging gives us this new ability to look under the hood at the mechanisms as they're happening. And I think that right now where we are with respect to reducing intergroup conflict is a lot like where baseball was before we were being, right? Right now, interventions are happening. There are hundreds of these programs, but they are almost never evaluated. Out of 500 interventions that Betsy Collick um, surveyed recently, 12 of them have been evaluated quantitatively. Almost no programs are even being tested whether they're having an effect. And as I just showed you, even intuitively plausible interventions, even good ideas like perspective taking, don't always work. They might work for some people some of the time. And that's what causal models are for. They're for knowing what's going to work and when it's going to work. The other problem is that when they are evaluated, the evaluations we have right now often have serious demand characteristics. People who've just spent six weeks in an intensive summer camp are asked, do you think that summer camp was good for you? Do you think you have a broader view on the world now that you just did it? These are people who came to camp because they were excessively motivated to learn to have a broader, more internationalist view or to learn to get to know the other side. Only people with excessive motivation spend their whole summer in an intergroup peace camp. And so then asking them afterwards, did that work for you, is not the most sensitive way to find out whether we're having the effect we want to have in the world. Not that it's bad. And not by the way that the scouts didn't run good baseball teams, right? Before Billy Bean, we had really good baseball teams. It's just that they weren't as good as they could be. And that's the same message I want to say about intergroup interventions, is that the potential for science here is not to take something that's failing and make it succeed, but to take something that's good and make it better. And just to give you an idea of what that might look like, I'm going to show you two examples of the science that we're doing and how it might contribute to this goal of using science to make better interventions. The first one is an fMRI experiment where we were looking at how people respond to arguments um, from the other side of the conflict. And here, again, the intuition is, well, here's a possibility. What, is, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to change people's minds and make them think the other side is right? Or are you just trying to make them think the other side is potentially reasonable? So that it might be possible to measure change in whether people think the other side is right. But what we wanted to do is measure their first gut instinct and whether their arguments are reasonable. Um, and we, get, we thought looking at their normal response to hearing the other side's view might be a sensitive way to see their first reaction to whether the other side's <coughs> arguments are reasonable. To do this, we developed a set of arguments. These are from real lab eds that we presented to um, Israelis and um, Arabs in the scanner. Some of these we describe as pro-Israeli. So these are arguments made by hawkish and right-wing Israelis about the Palestinian crisis, like Palestinians have wasted 60 years. Um, in that amount of time, they could develop to their own country. Um, there were 16 arguments from the opposite side. Israel is um, a South African apartheid regime. And then, 16 arguments not about the conflict at all, designed to just feel unreasonable. So this is uh, God destroyed New Orleans um, because of gay rights. Um, and 16 arguments that were a uh, neutral pack, like watermelon is a perfect fruit. <laughs> People, while they were inside the scanner, were telling us how reasonable or unreasonable they thought these arguments were. And the idea here is to use the arguments that are not about the conflict to look at what does your brain look like when you're reacting to an unreasonable as opposed to a reasonable argument. Um, so here's 
one person, this is activation in their brain, uh, that's a person looking at me, it's a sexual view through the middle of their head, showing where they had greater activity when they were reading these arguments that were irrational compared to the neutral that arguments. So that's one person, here's another person, and another person, and another person, and you can see that this is strikingly consistent activation. In, along the midline of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex and medial parietal cortex for responding to unreasonable arguments. We then wanted to know, would any of these be useful measures of the reaction in the context of the conflict? And we found that one of them was, this is medial parietal cortex, so just down in the middle of the head. And this brain region, if we looked at its response to the arguments about the conflict, so did it respond more to pro-Israeli or pro-Arab arguments? The extent to which this is now the brain region's response on the uh, x-axis, the more this brain region responded to pro-Israeli arguments, the more you expressed personally feeling warm towards Israelis. And the more it responded to uh, around us, yeah, right, the more it responded to pro-Arab arguments, the reverse, the less it responded to pro-Arab arguments, the warmer you felt towards Arabs. So a brain region that responds to irrational arguments. Now you take two arguments. I should have said, by the way, people not involved in this conflict say both of these arguments are irrational. These arguments are matched to be equally irrational to somebody who's not involved. But if you are involved, then the, it's the other side's arguments that look irrational. The more irrational they look, the more it activates this brain region. The more it activates this brain region, the less warm you feel towards members of the other group. And also, the more you show an implicit bias on an IHC measure. This is just an automatic action. So this brain region responding with the other side's views as irrational or unreasonable is also tracking with your overall attitude towards that other side, feeling cool towards them, and feeling biased against them. Um, so this is just a summary of those results from the Israelis and Arabs that we studied in 2009. We then replicated the study with another ideological conflict by studying Democrats and Republicans right before the last election and found a very similar brain region um, involved, again, in seeing the other side's arguments as unreasonable or irrational. This is obviously not yet in any way helping an intervention. What we're suggesting, though, is that here's a target. Right? If one of the things you're trying to make better in the world is the gut instinct that the other side is irrational, then this brain region's activation when you're listening to their story might be a target of something you're trying to change. That's the first example. The second example is actually trying to work directly with an intervention that's happening right now already. In this case, we couldn't scan people, so this is going to be just a behavioral experiment with a group called Salia. Salia is trying to put Americans and Arabs in direct interpersonal conflict. And they are doing it using online interactions, basically a multi-person Skype interaction that's mediated by a teacher and is conducted as part of a college course. The reason it's interesting to study virtual contacts or contacts done online is that compared to actually getting American college students to go to Lebanon or Jordan or Syria, especially right now with what's going on in the world, so doing it online is much cheaper potentially accessible to a much broader range of American students, and potentially much safer, making many more parents willing to have their children involved in it. It also has the benefit that the experiences are interspersed with your real life. So by contrast to just going, having a super intense experience, and then leaving it behind when you come home, making an interaction with the other group part of your college course means that you do it for an hour or two, and then you go back to your life, and then you come back to the interaction, so this experience of intergroup contact becomes a part of your everyday life, potentially. On the other hand, you might worry that compared to real contact, compared to person-to-person -person interactions like at a summer camp, being in virtual contact means that you basically don't get down to offline interactions. You don't get to just have a coffee or make an art project or kid around. All of your interactions with the other side are in this focused, mediated, and constructive contact where you're on topic the whole time. And relatedly, there's limited one-on-one -on -one interaction because these are groups of nine people always talking as a group. And so Celia came to us asking, can you help us evaluate whether we're making the difference that we want to make um, in the views of the students who are participating in our program? 
And I'll show you the first data that we have from this, um, which is going to again be a comparison of how participants felt towards the other group before participating in the semester long experience compared to afterwards. And we're going to compare the American students to a group of control kids who are in the same classes at the same schools but have been assigned to a different section of that course, which is not using CELIA. So these are kids who signed up for the same class but got assigned either to the section that is in direct interaction or is actually or is just being taught the theory without the experience. This study is particularly interesting to us because of when it took place. So we did this study last semester during the spring semester of 2013. And right in the middle of our study was a highly salient event, the Boston Marathon bombings, which were widely covered in the American media as the act of Muslims against Americans. So these are now American students in weekly contact with Muslim counterparts in the Muslim and Arab world. And now over the time in which there's been a violent act characterized as intergroup violence. And so a key question, what you might say a key goal of this program is, could Celia insulate their participants against the description or against the interpretation of this event as not just the act of these individuals, but as the act of their broader group? So we're going to look at the difference in how Celia participants compared to their match controls feel about Muslims and about Muslim society before versus after this semester on two measures. One is a measure of how, in general, how warm they feel towards Muslims. Muslim world. Um, control participants at the end of the semester felt less warm towards Muslims than they had at the beginning of the semester. You could see this potentially as an effect of the bombings, whereas Salia participants felt more warm at the end of the semester. And another critical thing we measured is the sense that the conflict between Americans and Muslims is intractable. We measured this by asking them, do you think there's a fundamental clash of cultures between Americans and the Muslim world? Again, if you see this as not just a local incident, but a fundamental clash of cultures, you might be less willing to engage for change. After the semester, control participants were more likely to endorse the view that there's a clash of cultures than they had been before the semester, whereas Celia participants were less likely to endorse that view. Now, all of this is on behavioral measures, which have the problems I described before. And so the broader vision is to combine the two things I just told you about, neuroscientific measures of how you respond to the other side with real interventions in real groups and contexts that matter. And if we can put all of that together, then maybe we can use what we know about how the psychology of conflict increases aggression and selfishness, along with what we want to know uh, in this hopeful vision of the future where science gets to play the role of the theme and maybe Michael Woods will write about it for us. Um, so that's it for now. I just want to again thank the postdocs who did this work, Nina Sakara and Neil Bruno, support from many local organizations, my lab, and that's the brain of my two and a half month old son. Thank you.